I'm Celeste and this is 10 Minutes of History from the Balboa Island Museum. Today we're going to talk about James McFadden. He, um, this, this is his picture right there. He's born in 1832 in New York. His parents, John and Effie McFadden, have come to New York from, um, they've come from Ireland, but they're from Scotland, from the Isle of Bute. And both of them are um, Scottish native. Um, they've immigrated over to the United States and they are farmers and they have a whole lot of kids. And amazingly, almost all of those children survive and um, work that farm. In um, 1868, uh, McFadden comes to California. Um, he's up in like the Salinas area. I think that he's, because that's a good farming area too, he's, he's checking that area out. Um, I think he stays there for a, a little while. It's, it's kind of a hard history to find um, of his whereabouts at exactly that time, but I think he's in that area. He comes down to the Newport Beach area. First he goes to Los Angeles and he sees the bay uh, that Banning has created, the wharf, the whole transportation system of getting goods from the, the Bay of San Pedro into Los Angeles. Um, Banning has purchased this large piece of property there, which he names Wilmington after his hometown of Wilmington, Delaware. And McFadden thinks this is wonderful. He sees this wharf, this big wharf, and has a train out on it so that he can get these goods from, Los An from, from the port of San Pedro into Los Angeles. And he's, he's mesmerized by this. He comes down on that same trip down to the Newport area. And this is just at the time when the rancho systems have failed and these lands are up for sale. Now the, um, the Rancho San Joaquin has been purchased all the entire thing by Irvine and his partners. But the Yorba Rancho, which is next to it, which would, would run on the other side of our bay, like Hope Hospital up to the mountains, it has been divided up by the courts. And the reason it's been divided is because there's too many heirs, there's too many people involved. So the courts step in and they take the percentages of what everybody is owed and they divide the property up by the percentages. Um, Irvine's part and his partners have already purchased three quarters of a mile of that um, property and the courts give them this one section that's, that's if you were looking from the ocean, would be this, this right-hand strip that goes up and which is gonna be important to McFadden later. McFadden buys 4,500 acres in basically, if we think of it as the South Coast Plaza area, and he's going to subdivide it immediately and sell a quarter of that off to farmers. Now, 1868 is an important time. First of all, we just come out of the Civil War. A lot of people have been displaced, and in 1869, they're going to finish the uh, Transcontinental, Transcontinental Railway, which is going to make it much easier for people to get here. Like Irvine, when McFadden first comes here, he's going, he goes down to Panama and comes across Panama to get up to this coast um, by, by ship, of course. And so this is, this is life-changing to so many people because prior to that, you had to come by uh, wagon train or in, and mostly that means you're walking. And so this makes it much more uh, attractive, especially to women, because lots of women died <laughs> during those trips having children. And so this was, this was a way that you could get here and start a new life if, if you didn't have a life for you back east anymore. So these people were very anxious to buy this property. So he sold these properties for between $8 and $15 an acre. And these people, many of them were highly religious people, they called this area the promised land. And uh, because when, uh, what I had told you before, all of this underground water made this just a perfect farming area. So um, the ranchers that were around them made fun of these people for calling to the promised land and they called it gospel swamp because it was very wet land and um, because these people were so religious. So that was their way of making fun of them. So according to the census, after um, McFadden sells off this property, he goes back to New York. 
And so he was in New York again for a while. And then in 1870, we have the Dunnell story, which we've told you before, where he comes in, brings his boat into the bay, and it becomes apparent that you can run a shipping business out of this bay. And he's very excited about this, and Irvine's very excited about this, and that's when they have that meeting on the ranch, and they decide that they're going to start this wharf area um, inside the bay, which is near PCH in Dover now. And so, um, uh, McFadden starts coming back here more often, but he still lives in New York. And in 1871, he actually gets married um, in New York to his wife, Jenny. Um, there, there is tales that he was married before, that he was a widow that he came, when he came out here, but I can't find any sort of a marriage certificate for him then. So I'm not quite sure that's true, but, um, but I do know for sure that he got married in 1871 when he was 39 years old to Jenny and they had two daughters. And in 1876, he moves Jenny and the two daughters to Santa Ana. And for the rest of his life, he lives between Santa Ana and Altadena. They have several different homes, beautiful homes that they built and, and live in. So um, they start up that wharf business, moving um, goods out of the bay, mostly the goods from his farmers and um, Irvine's wool from his sheep. And they do that for about 12 years, but the bay just never gets dredged enough um, because we still have all these sandbars moving around and it's dangerous. They lose a lot of product. In fact, they claim they had sort of like a little satellite out there um, near the wedge for so much, so much of the product that fell in the water that they would collect the wood because mainly they were bringing in wood um, and collect it on the beach there and to bring it across the bay. Uh, a, a pivotal thing happens about a dozen years into this business and it's their friend Tom Rule who's the pilot that helps the ships come into the bay he dies, he drowns in the bay, and it's devastating to them because he's a very good friend of theirs and one of their employees, so um, they decide they have to do something about this. So um, James appeals to the um, Army Corps of Engineers, please come out here from Washington, D.C., survey this property, um, give us money so that we can dredge this bay and make it a proper port. And so they do come, they, they um, park a boat off of the main Newport Beach. They're not happy, it's dangerous, it's hard to get into the harbor because this is free in jetties and the mouth of the harbor is actually moving around. So they um, they say, no, we're gonna give more money to Banning so he can improve his port. You're too far from Los Angeles. We, we still have um, Anaheim Landing up there at Seal Beach. So, But they said, we have, a, we have a, a good idea for you. We noticed in our survey that there's very deep water right off that point on the peninsula. And this is that same Newport submarine trench that we talked about before. They said, if you put a wharf out there, you can bring the largest ship of, in the world into that port because there's there's no dredging needed. It's already very deep and that's exactly what he does. And so 12 years into his bay shipping business, they take everything which was in this on this Newport landing here area here and they put these buildings on wood barrels and they float these barrels across the bay. There's no Lido Island at that time. There's mud flats, but they basically go from bay shores straight across what would be Lido Island to the point. And he starts to set up this little town on the point and he starts to build his wharf. Then he realizes, wait a minute, I didn't buy the land. I should buy the land. So he goes to the state and there's some controversy here too between tidelands and swamp and overflow land. He has to go to court, but he does end up buying the majority of the bay for a dollar an acre. And then he sets up this business. And what does he want? Of course, he wants exactly what Banning had. He wants a train. He needs to get these goods from the wharf to Santa Ana. So the first thing he does is he grades a road, but then he needs to build this railroad and he doesn't know how much track to buy. So this is one of the greatest stories I love. He takes his friend, H.G. Borden, and he puts him in the back of either a buckboard or a buggy, whatever story you want to believe at the time. This is in 1887. He puts him in the back of this buckboard and he ties a bandana to the spoke of the wheel. And he tells him, every time you see that bandana come up, count. And so they count out the mileage to um, Santa Ana. And using the pie formula with this nice circle, you can decide how many times it went around and, and um, times it out. And he ends up knowing that it's 11 miles from Santa Ana to the tip of his wharf. 
and he ends up making that railroad. And uh, we have a picture of it right here with the locomotive coming in here. This, this little town is growing up. Um, we've got a couple of little um, boarding houses there and a couple little shops coming in and a lot of fishermen and the wharf workers are living here. And this is a huge event when this train comes in. First of all, they brings the water in from Santa Ana. And the other thing is it brings in news. It does not run on Sunday because they're very religious and they won't do anything on Sunday. So on Sunday, you could fish off of this wharf. But um, everyone said they all showed up to come to in every time the train came in to find out what was happening, what was going on in Santa Ana. He, uh, he runs that business, that wharf business for about a dozen years. And then the railroad needs a little bit of repair. He um, decides that he's going to sell it and he, um, but he doesn't want to sell it to the Southern Pacific because he's friends with Irvine, and, and we know from our past discussion that Irvine has this big beef with the Southern Pacific and the Huntington's. And so he um, decides he's going to sell it to this man who has a sugar beet factory. Well, he does, he sells it, and then he finds out later that that man was serving as an agent for the Southern Pacific, and the only reason they bought the railroad was to shut it down. So. In a very short time, that railroad shuts down. And that is a completely different railroad from the red line that Huntington sets up coming down the bay. And some people get confused on that, so I just wanted to point that out. Um, McFadden does stay around. He's, um, he's hugely instrumental in creating Orange County, separating Orange County from Los Angeles County. He's, when you read about him in the history books, I mean, he did so much for the city of Santa Ana. He, um, when you read about his character, integrity, kindness, uh, just an absolutely wonderful person that was beloved. And he lives to be 86 years old. He, he died in 1919, had a nice long life. All his brothers and sisters had pretty long life. Um, his brothers, Robert and Archibald, they were also, um, and John were also very um, instrumental in, in setting up this area. They, they worked for him, they worked together. Just a really great family and, and, uh, and pivotal to our history here. So I think that's about 10 minutes and so we'll stop there. Thanks so much for listening.